Come on up. <laughs> no one wants to sit up close. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. Welcome. I'm going to give it a couple more seconds. And if people are joining on Zoom, we do ask that you keep yourselves muted just so that everybody can hear, um, you know, what's going on here. <laughs> okay, I can bring out some more chairs. <clears throat> Well, she just opened it and asked me if we could have a problem with it. Maybe can you talk louder or yeah, we can or maybe you open the other door and close that phone, like the one close this one open here. Closest. There's only those two doors. Yeah. Well maybe that she said that one doesn't open. This this one will open, but this doesn't. I can shut it. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's your big table in the middle and the only ones in here. It was so <laughs> weird. It was really funny. I was like, tonight. My name is Kaylee. I am the assistant director here at the Blue Hill Library. We are so Sarah Alexander, who is the MAFCA executive director here. Uh, if you don't know what MAFCA stands for, well, I'm not sure why you're here, but no, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, <laughs> it stands for Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. Um, and she's here to talk about the impact of PFAS on Maine farms. I wanted to talk a little bit about Sarah first before I let her talk about what she's here to talk about. So Sarah started working as MAFCA's executive director in 2018. Is that right, 2018? Mm -hmm. We have over 20 years of experience <clears throat> advocating for sustainable local and fair food systems. <clears throat> Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> a little bit of a cold. Um, she moved to Maine in 2015. And just prior to starting as executive director, you worked as a senior strategist at m &R Strategic Services, coaching progressive nonprofits and their membership engagement in digital communications. You also work with the White Earth Land Recovery Project, um, and then you moved to the American Community Garden Association, and you spent 10 years at Food and Water Watch, so you've been doing this for a while. <laughs> so we're very happy to have you here, and I will let you get started. And just as a reminder, if you're joining on Zoom, please keep yourself muted. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them at the end or through chat, but don't ask them, you know, <laughs> keep yourself muted, please. All right, great. Well, thank you, Kaylee. And thank you to the Blue Hill Library for inviting me to come talk tonight. It's so nice to see many of you and um, thank you for coming out and making it through the traffic. <laughs> um, I think we all got stuck in some portion of the traffic coming one way or another, but thankful we all made it. And how many, how many folks here are familiar with MAFCA and what MAFCA does? Great, I think that's basically everybody. Um, so I see some fair shirts. Uh, we have two staff members here, Nicholas and Elizabeth. Um, Nicholas is on our farmer programs team and Elizabeth is on our membership and development team. Um, Todd, who's a former board member. So 
this is such a wonderful gathering. I'm really thankful to be here tonight um, and to talk with you all. And um, you all know about Mafka, but if anybody on Zoom, we do have a number of people joining us on Zoom tonight. So if you're not familiar with Mafka, we are the oldest and largest statewide organic advocacy group in the country. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. We were instrumental in creating organic standards um, for certified organic production. So we certified the first organic farm in Maine in 1972. Um, we started the first apprenticeship program for organic farming and actually um, Representative Shelly Pingree was our very first apprentice in the mid seventies and you know, has an organic farm herself now. And um, we've been really fortunate to build such an incredible community of gardeners, homesteaders, growers, farmers um, here in the state of Maine and everywhere I go all around the country, um, people uh, either see my bag with the fair design on it or you know see a shirt I'm wearing and they recognize Mafka. And I think we are recognized nationally for really leading the way. And the topic that I'm here to talk about tonight um, is not a topic that I ever thought I would be talking about. I've worked on sustainable agriculture uh, for the last 20 years and um, PFAS was not on my radar anywhere. And I, I think it was on very few people's radar in Maine prior to a few years ago. And uh, we've quickly become um, an accidental experts on this subject because we've had to with the situation that, we've, that we're gonna talk about tonight. And so um, I guess I will just say, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a chemist. Tonight, I'm gonna talk about the lived experience that we're having here in Maine. We're learning new things every day. There are still many, many unknowns when it comes to PFAS. There's so much more to learn. And so um, what I'm gonna share tonight is what we know now. Um, it's more than we knew six months ago. It's more than we knew three years ago. And we're learning more every day. So the situation is rapidly evolving. And I want to leave plenty of time for questions tonight too. Um, so if, if there are questions that come up along the way, maybe just hold those and I'll make sure we, what, uh, Kaylee, what time do we need to stop tonight? We close at eight. <laughs> okay, well, we'll leave before then. Um, but I'll, I'll make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So how many people here have heard of PFAS? Okay, everybody. How many people have heard of PFAS prior to three years ago? Okay, a small handful. Um, I had, I really was not familiar with them. I had not heard of PFAS. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what PFAS are and, and the situation, how we got to where we are today. So PFAS are per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. This is a class of chemicals that includes thousands of chemicals. And really what it's referring to is a, a length of um, fluorinated carbons on a particular chemical. So it's a chemical structure. And what's unique about these chemicals is that the bonds on the fluorinated carbons are really strong and they don't break down. And for the uses that they're using them for in manufacturing, that is seen as a beneficial thing because they're grease resistant, they're water resistant, they're heat resistant. Um, Teflon was one of the original uses of, uh, uh, consumer uses of these chemicals. They were used in um, ammunitions and wartime manufacturing prior to that, but um, they're known for being you know, really resilient, really don't break down over time. And, so within our cycle here that we see on the screen, and, and hopefully folks can see this on Zoom as well, um, how does it get into, into our, how does it end up in our agricultural system ultimately? That is the question that we're here to talk about tonight. And there's several ways that happens. So these chemicals are used in thousands of different products, um, and they have been used for the last um, 50 years, 50 plus years. And so they end up in our waste cycle. And it starts with where the PFAS producing industries are. So we have our industries over here. Um, and those industries are both creating products that are going into the consumer cycle, but they're also creating waste. And that waste is going into our waste stream. And that happens in two ways. 
Some of those industries are directly releasing um, wastewater into our ecosystem. And, some, and then they're also sending their waste to wastewater treatment plants. The wastewater treatment plant is then processing it with the capacity and the technologies that they have. Um, but those technologies really are not meant to deal with PFAS. And so what the, comes out of the wastewater treatment plant are kind of two things, a solid, which is called sludge, or the nice name for it is biosolids. You'll see people refer to it as that. Um, and then the other thing that comes out of the wastewater treatment plant is treated water. And those are sent back into our waterways as well. So both of those things, because they're not being treated for PFAS, um, contain PFAS. So PFAS are going directly into the waterways and then they're going into the sludge. So then the sludge, something has to happen with that. And since the late seventies, the sludge, which is rich in nitrogen, has been um, really pushed to be used as a fertilizer on farms. And so it ends up, the biosolids are spread directly on farmland. And then some of that also has been landfilled. Now then the landfills you know, have leachate that comes out of them that also contains PFAS. Because PFAS is really hard to break down, it just continues in this cycle all through this map. So after it's spread onto the farm fields as a biosolid, then it's staying in the soil, it goes into the groundwater, so it's getting into our water system, and then the plants that are growing there are also taking it up. And then if those plants are being eaten by us or by animals or wildlife in the ecosystem, um, anything in that cycle that's eating those plants are now taking up the PFAS. Um, and then those food products come into our households, our waste goes into the wastewater treatment system, we are eliminating PFAS from our system all the time, um, and then the whole cycle starts over. So um, PFAS are very persistent. They're, again, that's seen as something that's beneficial for their use in manufacturing, um, but when it comes to us, our human health, our ecosystem, our environment, it's not so great. Um, so that's kind of the life cycle of what, of PFAS. The common items that almost all of us have in our household with PFAS include things like food packaging, household items like makeup, floss. Floss was a big one that um, when I learned about this, I was like, what? Why is there PFAS in my floss? I was using the Glide floss that oh, no. probably many of us use. Um, and that is coated in PFAS. So eliminate, you know, eliminated that from my household immediately, but um, so many things that we wouldn't think about. The carpets that we're standing on, if they've been coated with stain resistance, um, they have PFAS on them. Our chairs, our furniture, our clothing, um, Gore-Tex, boots, clothing that's waterproof, outdoor gear, anything with a durable waterproof um, or water repellent coating, um, nonstick cookware like Teflon, but also newer versions of that that are nonstick also contain PFAS and then firefighting foam. And it's because um, for the firefighting piece, it's because these chemicals can withstand high heat. Um, so they can, they've been used for um, putting out jet fuel fires. It's been commonly used in Department of Defense, kind of military training exercises, those sorts of things. So there are a number of sites throughout the country that are contaminated from firefighting foam that's been used. But as you can see, these are pretty common items and are pretty inclusive of so many consumer products that we all have in our households um, and that we may not know contain PFAS and are really ubiquitous throughout our system. So why should we be concerned about this? And I will say there's so much research that needs to be done about PFAS. But the research that has been done, at, especially on the older chemicals, the oldest two versions of these chemicals are PFOA and PFOS. And we know the most about those because they've been around the longest. Um, we know that there are direct links between exposure at low levels of these chemicals to these health impacts. And those include things like increased cholesterol levels, um, changes in liver enzyme, and there's been even more recent studies that have come out about liver enzyme diseases that are related to PFAS exposure, um, decreases in infant birth weights, decreases in vaccine response in children and adults, um, increased high blood pressure, and kidney and testicular cancer. Um, so there's a number of really direct related health impacts that have been studied that have been shown 
with uh, exposure to PFAS, these health outcomes are certainly things that we should be looking for or be aware of. So how would we be exposed to PFAS? Um, drinking water contamination. Remember on that big chart, there were so many things that were going directly into the water, the groundwater, our water systems, and the municipal waterways um, don't really have current ways that they're treating for PFAS in uh, municipal water systems. But Maine being an extremely you know, rural state relative to many other states, we have a lot of homeowners with wells. We have a lot of towns that have no municipal water systems. And so when groundwater is contaminated, well contamination is really of concern. And drinking water contamination is the, the largest pathway um, that, that we have been concerned about to date. Other ways that we can be exposed is um, by eating fish or other wildlife in Maine. Um, I guess it was a year and a half ago now, the state of Maine put out a do not eat advisory for deer that were harvested in the Fairfield area, which is one of the hot spots in Maine for contamination because the deer had accumulated so much PFAS in their systems um, from grazing on contaminated land. Um, accidentally swallowing contaminated soil or dust. So soil, um, the PFAS go into the dust particles. We can inhale those, we can ingest them. Eating food that was packaged in material that contains PFAS or eating food that has been contaminated with PFAS as it's grown. And then um, some consumer products, like I mentioned, the floss, you know, there are lotions and other personal care products that contain PFAS. So there are a number of ways that we may be exposed on a fairly regular basis that most of us are not aware of um, because most of this is really not um, disclosed in any way. Manufacturers do not have to disclose if they're using PFAS. And, um, you know, so we're, there are multiple pathways that we may have no idea around. So we're here in Maine and we are in a leadership position on this now. We're talking about this, we're investigating it, but PFAS are a national issue. And I just wanted to share this map. This is from the Environmental Working Group and um, they have several maps that show different sites, but this is a suspected industrial discharges of PFAS and um, it just shows you really how widespread this is. And part of this is because PFAS are being used in the manufacture of thousands of products. So think about where all those products are manufactured all over the country, all over the world, and the waste streams from those industries are then going into the waste streams locally or into the waterways. Um, here in Maine, the waste product that we are um, really grappling with now that we're finding out more about is that it was used in the manufacture of paper from our paper mills. So coating paper to make it grease or water resistant, um, coating paper plates. So we think that's one of the industrial discharges, um, or we know that that is one of the industrial discharges here in the state of Maine. So how does this relate to agriculture? I've just talked about toxic chemicals for the last 10 minutes. Um, and I think, we had no idea that it really related to agriculture. At least I had no idea that it related to agriculture until I found out about this in 2019. And some of you may have heard about uh, Fred and Laura Stone, Stone Ridge Farm, they're in Southern Maine. And there was some routine well testing that was happening around their property in 2016. It was not looking for PFAS, it was being done um, by the town. And they just happened to test some wells around Fred's property um, that did come back with levels of PFAS. And that kicked off an investigation. Well, where did this come from? The town was very surprised to find that it was there and, and started looking for possible sources of contamination. And um, eventually that investigation led to the farm. And um, Fred and Laura and Stone Ridge Farm, unfortunately, um, were the first farm in Maine to have known contamination from PFAS. They were the first one where this was found. And being in that, that unfortunate first position um, was really devastating. This is really devastating for any farm that deals with this. Um, but there was so little that was known at that time. And um, I really have to give kudos and appreciation to Fred and Laura. They've been outspoken advocates about this 
um, from the start, they are third gener generation dairy farmers in Arundel, Maine. And because they were the first farm, um, this has really been difficult for them. They've been financially ruined. They've gotten very little support from the state. Their farm was shut down. Yes. Did they spread sludge on their fields? They did spread some sludge on their fields, but I want to address that because no farmer is at fault for having PFAS contamination. The PFAS was, had no idea, um, you know, until recently, PFAS was never a thing that was thought to be in sludge. So farms were told in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and even more recently, that this was their civic duty. This was a wonderful fertility source, and it was their civic duty mm -hmm. to spread this on their farms. Um, I had a farmer tell me that, who is an organic farmer, um, that the people that were sort of peddling sludge came regularly and really twisted his arm and made it a guilt trip around how important it was that there was some, some really useful outlet for this nitrogen source and it was the best thing they could do. So I do wanna say no farmer is at fault here for this contamination, even if they chose to spread sludge because nobody knew that PFAS existed in the sludge when it was being spread. So Fred spoke out and Fred's story, um, in 2019 really triggered a series of actions within the state. So once this contamination was found on this farm, um, and at that time it was thought maybe this is isolated to dairy, so we better check out dairies first. The state started doing retail milk testing to go into stores and pull milk and test it to see if there was PFAS contamination in, that, in the retail level milk that we're getting. Um, and it also triggered a working group at the state, an investigation to look beyond, um, you know, just this one farm, but to think about what are the impacts of this throughout the state. And that task force working group came up with a series of recommendations um, that, have, that have been slowly being put into implementation. So that triggered a number of pieces of legislation that have happened um, since that initial um, investigation at Fred's farm in, in 2016 and then becoming more public in 2019. So in 2019, looking at the sewage sludge, state testing revealed that 95% of the wastewater sludge in Maine um, had higher levels of PFAS than what the recommended amount was that should be spread on soil at that point. Um, so that was really eye-opening for the state to say, oh, wow. <laughs> There's more PFAS going into our system here than we may have recognized. Um, so the sludge spreading on farmland was reduced significantly in 2019. Mm -hmm. That 95% that was testing above thresholds then went into the landfill, but there were still loopholes that remained, including loopholes around um, composted biosolids. So some of these, some of the wastewater sludge um, or biosolids would go to composting facilities where it be composted and concentrated further and sold to landscapers and sold as bagged compost at um, you know, garden centers and those sorts of things. So there was a loophole there. Um, the governor's PFAS task force recommended lots of actions. And again, you know, over the last two years, some of those have been put into action. Um, but the legislation that we've been working on here in the last two years, and MAFCA has been a part of this, have been really instrumental in creating um, some leadership steps that we could take to try to understand first, investigate, and then address this problem. So LD 1600, which was passed in 2021, required investigation of all spread, sludge spreading sites in Maine. And that's how we've now come to learn that sludge was spread on about 700 sites in Maine, or 700 sites were licensed in Maine over more than 40 years. And, the, and there was an, um, a requirement that the Department of Environmental Protection had to both uh, find where all of these sites were. So they had to go back through all the licenses from the last 40 plus years that they had, that they had issued. So they had to find where this had been um, spread or what had been licensed to be spread. And then they had to actually test those areas. And the legislature required that all of that testing be done by 2025. Um, so the first thing they had to do was find out where it was spread. And in 2021, the governor also allocated $30 million for PFAS investigation and cleanup. And that was primarily directed towards um, drinking water. 
uh, through the Department of Environmental Protection. But in 2020, um, as more sites, so after the retail milk testing happened, there were a couple more dairies that were found that had very high levels of PFAS contamination. Both of those were in the Fairfield area of Maine, which has now been found to be a hot spot. And currently over 200 homeowner wells have been contaminated with PFAS above the thresholds um, that are safe for drinking. So that initial $30 million was really directed towards um, PFAS cleanup and investigation in the, in the Fairfield area. A couple of other things really happened, and this is, this is important because um, we need to turn off the tap on PFAS, right? Like we can't just stop spreading it, but we need to stop bringing it into the state. We need to stop putting it into our waste streams. And so in 2021, um, we passed legislation that required the phase out of all non-essential uses of PFAS in Maine by 2030. Um, so there's a process in place to look at um, where PFAS is, how to get companies to disclose that, and then to phase those out by 2030 so they will no longer be allowed to be sold in Maine. Um, and then we also set the drinking water standards for six PFAS, six of the PFAS that we know the most about, that we know are most harmful to human health um, in drinking water at 20 parts per trillion. And we created one of the strongest waste or water standards in the country. Um, the EPA guidance at the federal level is 70 parts per trillion. That's a guidance that's not a mandate. And so we set it below that. And as we learn more, um, there's a possibility it should really even be lower than that as well. So after the Department of Environmental Protection started looking into this, um, this is what they found. And they disclosed this map at the end of last year. Um, first time I saw it was in December of uh, 2021, where they published this map. This is where all of the licenses were issued for the spreading of sludge or septage. And septage is um, what is pumped out of septic tanks. Again, Maine is a very rural state. So uh, sludge is coming from municipal wastewater treatment and septage is what is pumped out of um, our septic tanks in rural areas. And so once this came out, and folks started to see it, we started to say, wow, number one, this is much more widespread than at least I had any idea about, I think, than many of us had any idea about. And it also started to give us some indication of who might be at risk, um, which areas, which farms, and um, gave us more information about where we needed to look. And that's when we come to sort of the second wave of PFAS contamination on farms. And all of this has happened within the last six months. So as I mentioned, this is all evolving in real time. We learn more every day. Um, this is Johanna Davis and Adam Nordell from Songbird Farm. And that map that I just showed you, um, one of their customers mm -hmm. told them in December, hey, I just saw this map and I think that your farm might be on it or surrounding your farm might be on it and you might want to get tested for PFAS. And um, Adam and Johanna have been very public in sharing their story and we're very grateful for that. So um, I can reshare parts of their story here tonight. And I do encourage folks to go directly and, and learn more about Adam and Johanna's situation. Um, but Adam and Johanna tested for PFAS. They tested their well water they did a soil test, they tested, and they tested their spinach and um, one of their uh, grain crops, because they're grain farmers in addition to being vegetable farmers. And they got the results back two days before Christmas mm -hmm. last year, and the results were off the charts. Their well water, our state threshold is 20 parts per trillion, and their well water was about 8,000 parts per trillion. And so they knew pretty immediately um, that there was something to be concerned about here. The soil and the, um, the, the vegetable and the food samples, we knew very little about because there were no thresholds for those. And I should state, there still are no thresholds for any of our other food crops outside of milk and um, beef and then drinking water. So Adam and Johanna, um, who have been extremely um, courageous and, and brave through this entire ordeal, um, knew that as organic farmers, 
the thing that's most important to them is the health of their customers and the trust and the integrity that is in the food that they're growing in that in their farm. Um, so they immediately pulled all of their products from the market. They called Mafka. We got uh, an email and a call right away that they had these test results and they were gonna pull all of their products and let all of their customers know what was going on. And that triggered a, a whole series of actions. And I'm sure in the moment it felt very slow to Adam and Johanna. In fact, I know it did. There were, there were no resources for them. There were no support. Even though Fred Stone had been through this several years earlier and we had had a couple other dairies, um, the state still did not have any systems in place to really support any farms who were going through this, this terrible um, situation. And so um, Adam and Johanna really expressed to Mafka and, and the state and Maine Farmland Trust um, what they were going through and what their needs were. And within a month of Adam and Johanna testing and getting these results back and us talking to them about how we could support them, then another farm got test results back and then another farm and then another farm. And an initial visit that was supposed to be just with Adam and Johanna and the state and um, Maine Farmland Trust to talk about the situation on their farm quickly turned into a listening session with five farms from the Unity area that were all heavily impacted by PFAS contamination. And we were supposed to meet for a, an hour or two to talk about what their needs were um, from their farm perspective. And that quickly turned into a day long meeting to really listen to what these farms were going through and what the immediate needs were. And that set the agenda for the work that we've been doing this year that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, but I do just wanna give another you know, praise and, and kudos to Adam and Johanna and all of the farms who have been going through this. This is devastating for any farm that's dealing with this and without the courageous um, actions of all of the farms this year and sharing their stories, we would not um, be where we're at today and taking the actions that we've been taking. Yes. Can I interrupt for a moment? Quick question. Sure. Um, so back to this stone farmers being certified organic. Yep. Which we have been. Did the PFAS issue come up with being certified organic or, or were they flying totally unknown? Yeah, well, I, I am going to talk about how, yeah, how it gets to certified organic. So yeah. I, I am going to get to that in a minute. And, okay. and thank you for raising that because that's another part of their story that, that's here on the slide, but that I didn't directly mention, right. which is that they're certified organic. The farmer that they bought the farm from had been certified organic. And the spreading of sludge is not allowed in the National Organic Program. So certified organic uh, farms are not allowed to spread sludge. However, the farm that the two Before. farm owners Before. prior to them had spread sludge in the 90s and they had no idea about it. This had happened decades earlier before they even bought the farm. Before. It was in the soil. It was in the soil, yes. And it, it stays in the soil. Certified organic. Yeah. Yes, and there's no, nobody, nobody knew about it, right? And this is how, well, we're learning, we're learning more every day. Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and it's a great question. A lot of people do have that question. How can, how can something be certified organic if it has PFAS? And so I'm going to get to that in just a few minutes. So I do just want to share, you know, we all have um, background levels of PFAS in our blood and um, the, the bar charts that you see here down on the bottom is like the Red Cross blood donors and it's like a national just average of, of where we're at. So I think it's about three parts per billion um, in all of us. We all have PFAS and you can see communities Oh, sorry, the Red Cross blood donor is a little bit further, but this is like the national average. Um, communities that are highly impacted, like the Alabama communities, the Ohio River Valley, where these chemicals were manufactured, um, they have higher levels uh, on average in their blood from the drinking water and from the air and other exposure that they've had. And then the 3M workers and the DuPont workers 
who have been manufacturing these chemicals have the highest levels of um, contamination within their blood. <laughs> And Adam and Johanna have shared this as well publicly, but they've done their own <laughs> blood serum testing and they have uh, 2,700 parts per billion in their blood. So almost three times that of the workers that are in these um, chemical companies that are manufacturing the chemicals. And that's because um, in the farm, so I really wanna center that, that when we think about this, the farmers are the most heavily impacted by this from a health perspective, they've been, drinking the water, they've been eating the food, they've been working in the soil and breathing in the dust and the air. And so again, just to reiterate, no farm is at fault for this. And they're likely the most heavily impacted from a personal perspective, from a health perspective, and then also from a business financial and their livelihood perspective. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, there, there are some hopeful pieces of this. And I wanted to just share this chart briefly to show that these are blood levels um, of the most common PFOS in people that have come down over time. In the year 2000, PFOS, which is one of the oldest PFOS chemicals, um, the DuPont and 3M voluntarily stopped manufacturing that in, in about 2000. And so as they've taken that out of the ecosystem, we can see that it has gone down over time what those levels have been in our blood. Um, and the same is true with some of the other, you know, uh, most common PFAS chemicals. As they're phased out, they do, we do have a half-life with them. It's long in humans and it bioaccumulates. So the more that we're exposed, the more we'll have in our systems. But if we stop that exposure and we can turn off the tap and we can stop that contamination, it will leave our systems eventually. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about food because um, we all eat, we all care about food and how does it get into the plant and what part of the plant should we be thinking about or should we be concerned about? And PFAS does not show up in all plants equally. And that's because it accumulates in the plant in different areas. And what we know about this so far to date, and this is from our crop specialist on, on staff here at MACTA, is that the PFAS accumulates in the parts of the plant that photosynthesize. And that's because it's being taken up um, through the water and through the soil, you know, comes up through the roots into the plant. And when the water transpires out of the leaves, it's staying in the leaves, it's staying in the parts of the plant that photosynthesize. So when we think about crops that are impacted for human health, it's likely things like lettuce and leafy greens, the part where we're eating the green part of the plant, and it less accumulates in grain and fruit and root crops. And we do see that this chart is a little hard to read. So I apologize for that. Um, but this is the levels of PFAS contamination um, in these different vegetables um, in a highly contaminated and then in a background level field. And so what this is showing you, the shoot vegetables are really the leaves. This area here is, is the, where you're eating the leaf of the plant, leaf lettuce, um, radish greens, carrot greens, Chinese cabbage, Chinese chives. And we see much lower concentrations in grains, um, wheat, corn, soybean, in the fruits of the plant, the flowers like cauliflowers, the flower would be considered flower vegetable and fruit vegetables, and then in the root vegetables. So it really does accumulate in the leafy green part of the plant. Um, we're also learning a lot about livestock. And I should say there's, again, so much more research that needs to be done here. Um, but I just wanted to share this. And we've had some direct experience with research that Mafka has done in coordination with um, one of the contaminated dairies that uh, the half-lives in animals are shorter than they are in humans. So in a dairy cow that's being milked, the half-life for PFAS is about two months. Um, so within about 60 days, if let's just use an example, if the milk was at 800 parts per trillion, in two months, it'll be at 400 parts per trillion. Two months after that, it'll be 200 parts per trillion. Two months after that, it'll be 100 parts per trillion and so on. And so over the course of months or years, depending on what the animal is and what the levels are, the animal will get it out of its system. And the half-life is even shorter for things like chickens and eggs. So um, the chicken half-life and the egg half-life is, is weeks or days versus months. Yes. Is that, is that only if the PFAS is turned off? 
water? Yes, right? once they have clean water and clean feed. So if they're continually eating contaminated feed or drinking contaminated water, um, so it, so the half life only happens yeah once there's the contamination or exposure is stopped. Um, and we have so much more to learn about this, but we do believe that you know over time a dairy herd, for example, or a beef herd or other animals, you know that once they're on clean water and clean feed, um, they will get that PFAS out of their system. So again, what does this mean for farmers? So I just want to reiterate here, um, you know, and this has been really the emphasis of our work is working directly with the farm families, but that our farmers are the ones who are most impacted by this in this moment. Um, they're certainly their health um, for their own health monitoring and consideration around their exposure levels. Um, also the mental health pieces that come along with the stress and uncertainty that comes with this difficult and terrible situation. Um, financially, this could mean lost sales if they're pulling all of their products from the market. Um, these farms have debt obligations, they've invested in infrastructure and equipment. Um, they may not be able to you know, meet those debt obligations. And then now their land is contaminated. So they've lost la the value in their land and they may have also lost the value in their brand. Um, and this is not an organic or a conventional issue. This can affect any farm as we've seen, um, but we know that um, integrity, you know, all farmers, every farmer I know, I know wants to provide healthy food to their customers, to their consumers, regardless of what their, you know, operation is. And so um, that relationship to their customers, to their market is the most important thing. And when their brand is damaged, that's, that's really harmful. Um, and then again, the stress and uncertainty that these farms are thrown into because now they may know they have contamination, but hardly anybody can tell them what this means, what it's gonna mean for their individual crops, what it's gonna mean for their family, what it's gonna mean for the future of their farm. Um, so this is a really challenging situation. So what Mofka's response has been is, um, we have done a lot with our farmer support team. And Nicholas is on that team. Um, we have eight, uh, eight folks who are on the farmer programs team who provide direct technical assistance to our farms generally. And again, our, our folks have had to get up to speed really quickly on this. So Caleb Goosen, who is our crop specialist, um, he has been providing direct technical assistance and helping interpret test results, trying to help farms make management decisions and understand you know, what this may mean for their farm and how they can have a viable path moving forward. And we do, do believe that there, there are viable paths, you know, the, the animals that are able to get it out of their systems, there are crops that take up less of it. And so every farm is a unique situation with understanding how are they going to have a path forward? What is going to be viable for them? And um, unfortunately, there may be some situations where the land is too contaminated that it's not going to be safe to grow food there in the future, in which case um, we the farm buyout program um, that the state is looking to set up will be something that we're gonna be advocating for. Um, we're providing testing support. We set up um, a, an emergency fund to provide farms reimbursement or to pay for testing so that that was not a barrier and obstacle for any farm that wanted to get tested. And then we're, we've been administering the PFAS emergency fund with Maine Farm Land Trust, and that's to provide direct income support to farms that have had to pull products. We're also providing mental health support stipends um, through that emergency fund. And then we've been doing a tremendous amount of coalition work um, with statewide agencies, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Maine CDC have all been instrumental in working with farms and we work in coalition with them as well as other ag service providers to advocate for these farms and make sure that they have the supports they need. Um, the FARSAN network is the farmer, stress, farmer and rancher stress assistance network. So again, providing some of those mental health support services. And then we're also doing federal coalition work um, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Maine is not the only state as we know this is a national issue, but we need a national response on this. So the legislative action that we um, were able to make happen this year, and this was through all of that incredible coalition work, and again, um, the stories of the farms coming forward and sharing their courageous 
um, testimony at the legislature and others that testified at the legislature um, helped us pass these landmark pieces of legislation. So LD 1911 prohibits all land application of sludge and sludge derived compost. So it closed that loophole on the other 5% that was still being land applied or that was still going into compost and made us the first in the nation to do that. So Maine is the only state that completely bans the land application of all sludge and sludge derived compost. Maine also created a farmer safety net of $60 million to support impacted farmers and PFAS research. And that includes things like the income replacement program, the testing program, um, health monitoring for the farms, the farm buyout and infrastructure programs to help them make those farm pivots if needed, as well as allocating funds for a tremendous amount of PFAS research that needs to happen so we know, you know what needs to happen moving forward. LD 1875 required the state to come up with a plan to treat the landfill leachate from um, for PFAS. So now that these things are going into the landfill, um, we really need to make sure that the landfill leachate is not just further contaminating our waterways with the PFAS that's coming out of that. And LD 2019 phased out roughly 1,600 main registered pesticide products containing PFAS by 2030. Um, so giving the Board of Pesticide Control the authority to do that. Um, to make sure that we're not land applying pesticides that contain PFAS and contaminating our um, land through another mechanism. So what's the remediation potential here? Um, the good news is that on water, the current best practice is to filter with an active carbon filter and the testing that the state has been doing so far does show that that does get the levels down to non-detect at least what we're able to detect currently through um, laboratory testing. Um, those that has to be an ongoing situation where those homeowners or those farms are continually monitoring those filtration systems and ensuring that they're still working and, and changing out the filters. Um, and the state is providing that as long as they have funding. Um, soil, currently there is no proven remediation strategy. Um, there's hope for some phytoremediation, but then the plants take up the PFAS and then you have to dispose of the plants some way. Um, you can't compost them because then it's just in the compost and you can't spread that. So landfilling right now really is the least harmful option in terms of stopping that cycle of PFAS ending up, you know, even, even further down the stream. And there is beginning research on bacterial remediation and micro, micro remediation, but it's really early days and um, there's so much more research that needs to be done about that and um, you know, there is, uh, while I'm eternally hopeful and optimistic that there is some bacteria or fungi that wants to eat these, um, our crop specialist, Caleb, says that it would take so much energy for the bacteria to break apart the really strong bond that it may not be beneficial for the bacteria to do that because they have to exert a lot of energy to then be able to break the bond to get energy from whatever they're consuming. So um, really interesting. And again, you know, a year from now, we're going to know so much more. Five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, um, the research that will hopefully be done on this, there will be solutions in the future. Um, we just don't have them at the moment. So to your question about organic certification, um, organic agriculture is a management system and it requires a 36 month transition period from conventional agriculture to the harvest of an organic crop. So land may have been conventionally managed previously, and there's a three month, or sorry, 36 month, three year transition period for that land to go from conventional agriculture into certified organic agriculture. Um, biosolids are not permitted in certified organic farming. And once the thresholds that are developed, and again, right now in Maine, we only have thresholds, action thresholds for milk and for meat. There are more action thresholds that will be coming out. Um, but once it's shown that a product is above a state action threshold, it can no longer be certified organic. So that has to be pulled from the market. That'll be a state law that will require it to be pulled from the market, but that product can no longer be certified organic because it is um, adulterated. And we have been advocating at the federal level with the National Organic Standards Board around this issue. Unfortunately, Maine is the leader, the leader on this issue right now. We're the only one who's testing. We're the only one who's out in front on this. We know that 
other states will be finding this and will be coming down the pipeline, but um, the national there's very little federal action on this at this moment. And the in terms of us knowing about it, so none of us knew about PFAS. And um, Caleb, who I, I hope you all meet someday, very excited he's on our staff, very smart. He likens this to if you had a green certified house and you went and you got all of the green certified, LEED certified materials and you built it to all the specifications and the LEED certification people came and said, great, it's LEED certified. You did all the right things. You, you built it as it was supposed to be. And then you found out that the land that you built that house on was contaminated with PFAS. The house would still be certified lead, so it's still you still did all the right things. You still did that; it met the certification, but you had no idea that it was built, you know, on a contaminated site. And that's where we're at with the organic farms today that are experiencing this. They had no idea that they were growing food on contaminated soil. Most of this spreading happened decades before these farm, the current farm owners, you know, had these farms. And um, so they're doing everything right in terms of their organic management practices, but they're doing it in an unfortunate setting that they had no idea was contaminated. So federal action is needed, as I mentioned, and there's so much more. I mean, we could do a whole nother session just on the federal action, but I'll synthesize it here. We have three main agencies um, that really are responsible for different aspects of this crisis and this situation. So the FDA sets our food safety thresholds. They're the ones who are supposed to be testing our food supply to see if it is contaminated with PFAS. Um, they are doing some of that. They're not doing enough. They're not testing in the right ways from our perspective, and they have set no thresholds for this. So there's very little action that's happening. We are collecting petitions that we're gonna be delivering to the FDA this summer to their regional office. Um, so you can go online on our website and sign that petition now if you wanna uh, have your petition be delivered when we take it um, probably next month. And um, the FDA has a lot of work to do on this from a food perspective. The EPA has been doing some work on this and there is a PFAS roadmap that the EPA has issued um, last fall, they issued uh, a roadmap to address this issue. But the primary thing that needs to happen at the EPA is they need to designate this entire class of chemicals from our perspective as a hazardous chemical. They need to make a hazardous chemical declaration. So then the other laws that govern hazardous chemicals will then govern these um, this class of chemicals as well. And the USDA has not a single program right now that applies to um, PFAS contaminated farmland. The only program that's been able to be used to date is the dairy indemnity payment program for adulterated milk. So some of our dairy farmers have been able to get some payments for milk that they have not been able to sell. Um, but the USDA doesn't have this on their radar anywhere else. And so we believe that the USDA really needs to help create that farmer safety net because as other states tar start testing for this, farmers should not be left holding the bag. This is not the farmer's responsibility. The responsibility lies with the manufacturers of these chemicals and the industries that have disposed of them um, improperly. And then congressional actions, um, you know, we're always working towards congressional actions. Action there is often slow as many of you know, um, but there are bills to ban PFAS in food packaging and consumer products. And we would like to see those move forward again to help turn off that tap. So you can go to mafka.org slash PFAS to learn more. All of our resources are up there. That's where you can also sign the petition. We also have an email sign up sheet in the back. If you're not on Mafka's email list already or get our information, um, Elizabeth has that sign up sheet and we'd love to have you sign up and we will take some questions. And it's also getting very warm in here. So maybe we could try to open the door a little bit. Yes. The uh, Moscow Fairgrounds, formerly a potato field. Yep. Uh, it's the stats there. Yes, Mafka has tested our own wells and the Common Ground Country Fairgrounds. Um, those wells, we have two wells on the fairgrounds themselves that are technically public drinking water sources because of the size of our fair. They are non detect for PFAS. So that is amazing news. Um, we do, however, have an adjoining property, not on the fairgrounds, um, but it is further down the road uh, where there's a little house where we have some staff that use that house. The Maxim Lawn? 
Nope, it's part of the, um, it's across from the red barn. It's what we call the annex. Um, and so that well at the annex actually did test about 40 parts per trillion for PFAS and we worked with the state to get a filter on that. So it's not part of the public drinking water system. It's not part of the fairgrounds. Um, the public actually really doesn't go there. It's only staff who goes there. Um, but we did test all of the wells um, that, that people drink from on our property and did find that we had contamination in that one well. Yeah. I know in the beginning um, you were talking about like common like household products that contain PFAS. And I was wondering if we know like, are there specific brands that use it or is it really like all? Like when you're talking about the floss, like is that, are we to assume that it's in it unless otherwise like indicated or? Um, it's yeah, it's really tricky to figure out with brands because they really don't disclose it. Um, so there there is some sleuthing out there on the internet. If you just Google, you know, floss with PFAS, um, there are they do list some certain brands that people have found. Um, not all floss contains PFAS. They're the waxed floss, for example, does not contain PFAS. So when you think about what PFAS might be used for, it's anything that's really slippery, right? It's like uh the um, non-stick non -stick coating or water repellent or heat resistant. So that those sorts of things might be what you Would think the about. the environmental working group, the PWG, are they actively involved in it? I mean, I mentioned them, but are they, is that a place to go to find out? Yes, they do. Brand? They don't, I don't know if they have any product lists. They do have a lot of information on their website about um, food packaging and other like consumer uses. And so they have done very little on agriculture. We've been working with them because um, Maine is really the first state that has tackled this issue from an agricultural perspective. Um, other groups have been doing work around the consumer products and consumer packaging. And so they, they are a great resource. They have a lot of information. One more question. Are the, I know that receipts that you get at a grocery store are very contaminated and also having a printer in your house and sitting near that. Is that, is that a PFAS or is that something else? I do believe that some of the heat transfer receipts do contain PFAS. Um, so not all receipts, not all paper printed receipts, but the ones that are like heat transfer, um, I believe do contain PFAS. And I'm not sure about home printers. I'm in the paper world. Oh, great. For what it's worth, most of the paper made in Maine does not contain PFAS. Um, it, where you really find it is grades that are made to be grease or water resistant. Yes. That's not, that's not the paper that Maine makes a lot of. Yes. Yeah. I believe the source in Maine was paper plates that were made to be grease resistant. Paper plates. Um, mm -hmm. For what it's worth, um, 3M in 1980 pulled a product called FC807, which was used for almost all grease proof packaging. And they pulled it very quietly and just said um, too much fluorinated chemistry in it. And they came out with something different. So I believe they went from really bad PFAS to what we have today. Mm -hmm. Back in 1980. Yeah. And I've always wondered if there ever been any medical research on the long-term effects in human and animal and accumulation of these chemicals. I think the short answer is no. I don't think there's been a lot of research on the long-term impacts. Um, we were just talking about this earlier, and you know, the, the companies that manufacture these actually probably have the most information and have done the most research on it over time. But that's proprietary, and they generally don't have to disclose that. And um, you know, there this is a whole class of chemicals, and I, you're, I believe absolutely the the chemical companies themselves have recognized early on that some of these chemicals were problematic and so they created alternatives. And um, the EPA just came out with a guidance last week around drinking water. So PFOA and PFOS are generally regarded as the worst of these chemicals. They're the oldest and the chemical companies did phase those out in the early 2000s. But there are subsequent chemicals that they've replaced them with that are supposed to be less harmful. Um, I think what we don't know is the total accumulation of all of these chemicals. So it's not just, you know, just PFOS or PFOA, but you, when we did the well testing um, at MAFCA, the, there's only about 26 uh, PFOS fluorinated chemicals that are currently able to be tested for um, in our well water out of thousands. 
And so out of those 26, I think that we had something like 14 or 16 in our water. And what the 20 parts per trillion is, is the sum of the six of those that the state is most concerned about. Um, so there's so much more research absolutely that needs to be done about, you know, the all of these chemicals, but sort of what are the interactions when these are all together, when they're all mm -hmm. accumulating in your system, some are longer chains, some are shorter chains, some may stay in your body for longer, some may stay in for less long, but you're carrying this burden um, from this exposure and you know it it's very little is known about it at this point. I think a lot of this comes under the umbrella of microplastics mm -hmm. in our system. We are so loaded with microplastics now that keep us are just a very small part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're gonna get this soil tested. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, we do not recommend that people do their own soil testing because soil is very easy to cross contaminate. Um, so we recommend we work with Northern Tilth primarily um, to contract with them to do the soil testing. And if you have a farm, if you're an agricultural enterprise, you can apply on MOFCA's website to get, we contract with Northern Tilth to do the testing for farms. Um, so you can apply for that if you're an agricultural um, enterprise. And for homeowners, um, really, you know, drinking water, if you're, if you're in an area that may have been spread with sludge, um, you, I would recommend starting with drinking water testing. And the state, if you're in a tier one site, which the state has tiered out all of the areas where um, sludge was spread based on the highest risk uh, in their opinion. And so they're going through all of that testing, you know, over the next few years. But if you're in an area of concern, if you have high test results that come back, um, contact the Department of Environmental Protection and they will you know, work with you. They'll pay for the water filtration if you need a water filter system. Um, they'll reimburse you for the test if you have a high test result. And then they can also, well, they will help you interpret the test results. Um, I will admit that when we got our test back at Mafka, it was definitely a little like reading Greek was like, I have no idea what this means. There's like, you know, 10 pages of numbers and different things. And so, um, you know, DEP will help you understand what the test results are for your water and will help you with remediation steps if that's something that, that you need. Kaylee? So someone from Zoom, Lita Beth, asked, uh, why can't we stop invest in getting into consumer products and food packaging now instead of in case? Yeah, so the question was, why can't we stop PFAS from being in consumer products now instead of by 2030? And I, I think it's complicated. So um, I don't even think we know what are all the products that these PFAS are in. Um, there's no, you know, there's very little disclosure on behalf of the companies. And then they also have to find alternatives. So I think that, you know, there may be many uses that are um, superfluous that are just, you know, they could replace it with something, but there are some uses um, that may be deemed critical to whatever the, the thing is that they're manufacturing. So alternatives have to be found. And so the legislation that was passed to phase it out by 2030 was to give time for the industry to find replacements for these chemicals. And I'll share one um, exciting thing I heard recently around food packaging is that um, there actually is a company in Maine that's looking at using seafood, uh, seaweed, uh, a byproduct from seaweed as a coating for uh, compostable paper products that also provides some amount of uh, water resistance, but is biodegradable and is part of a natural product. And so I think the more that we know about this, the more that industries are looking into it. I think there are a lot of companies out there who absolutely want to do the right thing and can help find solutions to this and, and they have a really important role to play in this. Yeah. Can you speak to this particular area? I don't know if you're like I know I've seen on I've seen on the map that there are two or three sites, Deer Isle and one in Deer Hill where sludge was used, but do you know anything specific or does anybody in the room know anything specific about this area? I don't personally, but Nicholas, do you know anything specifically about this area? Yeah, a little bit. From, from the map, I looked at that probably about a year ago or more. There were four licenses given in the area, but in addition to that for spreading, that doesn't necessarily mean that 
those licenses were used to spread. <clears throat> I know that the town of Stonington had a stockpile for a while. I know um, Paul and Amanda at King Hill Farm has tested their, their water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that came back from below the threshold. Where are they? King Hill Farms in Penobscot. Mm -hmm. And that was owned by someone who had a license and spread mm -hmm. twice and kept very good records and it was just on pasture. Yeah, so the, the map is definitely a place to look, but it's not, um, mm -hmm. it, do, it, don't, it d tells you very little and it's just an indicator of where something may have happened and it doesn't mean that it did. Um, but, you know, I think, and I, I guess what we would also encourage homeowners, if you're, if you're not anywhere near any place that may have been spread, um, to, if you, if you don't have a reason at this moment to believe that you may be at high risk, um, there's very limited testing resources available in this moment. And, um, there's really a big backlog for soil and water testing. Um, depending on the laboratory, some tests are taking you know, six to eight weeks to come back. And so um, as this, the state is trying to add testing capacity, and I think we will see more testing capacity coming online um, over the next year. Um, but you know, when you look on the map, there are some parts of the state that seem to have relative little risk. Um, there wasn't much spreading that occurred. Um, because of the geography or, you know, the area or the more heavily populated areas where there was a lot of wastewater that needed to be disposed of, um, that central corridor kind of in Maine seems to be the, the worst. And then um, the Kennebec Valley Sanitation District was accepting the paper mill waste where they were coating the paper with PFAS. So the waste that was spread from there um, seems to be the most heavily contaminated that's been found so far. So you know, I think assessing one's relative risk, you know, we are all exposed to this. Um, we do all have it in our bodies and it's not, what, what we're most concerned about are those high levels of contamination, finding those, getting them out of our food system. And I guess just to end on a positive note, I do feel that Maine has the safest food supply in the country right now, because we're the only ones who are actually testing for this and removing products from the market when they're found to have High levels of contamination. So we are the only state that's actually being proactive in this way. Um, so please support your local farms. Um, it's more critical than ever. And um, they're doing the right thing. And, and our food is, is safe and healthy. And again, um, you know, I think we're such a leader on this. Not that we want it to be. Um, it's not the thing that you want to be lead on, but I think it says a lot about us as a state and how we support our farms, how we support our communities and how we support our public health um, and our environmental health and the ways that we're addressing this. Um, okay, I have three more questions. You had your hand up and then you and then Becky. Mine's quick. Is the EWG map, the, like the map that you're referring to with all the dots on it? Yeah. And that they, like the main one right now that has like, accumulation of contaminated spots the the, the federal maps e, the environmental working group does have several federal maps that show both um, municipal water testing that's happened industrial uh, discharges and then um, firefighting and department of defense sites as well which are other hot spot areas around the country where a lot of that firefighting foam mm -hmm. was used okay. and then the state of maine has the map with the um, 700 sites listed on it that you okay. can type in an address and see, you know, if there was anything that occurred around that. And you can find that on the Department of Environmental Protection's website. Okay. It's also linked on the MOFCA site, I think, under the Farmer Resources. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. Sure. Uh, just a very practical question. How is, has MOFCA altered its requirements to be certified from the PFAS situation? Yes, well, MOFCA certification. So for anybody who doesn't know, MOFCA, the nonprofit, has an LLC called MOFCA Certification Services, which is an accredited certifier for the National Organic Program, which is through the USDA. Um, MOFCA, as I mentioned earlier, created our own organic certification back in the 70s. Um, but in the 90s and early 2000s, that program became a federal standard. So it was harmonized across all states. 
So MAFCA is certification services is accredited under the USDA. And so we have to follow the USDA rules. We Does can't, no, the USDA rules That's have not answer. changed because, and so the, the, the longer answer is that we don't have the ability to change those rules. What we are able to do is when um, the state sets a threshold for a particular product, if that product is adulterated, if it meets that threshold, then we can remove that from certification. It can, it can no longer be certified. Um, but I think in MAFCA's approach to this, which is about education, working with our farms, supporting our farms, providing technical assistance, again, I think that the farms where contamination is being found, those farmers are pulling products voluntarily um, and they're off the market. Those are not getting to consumers. And they're doing that out of their own desire to do the right thing. They're, the state isn't forcing them to do that. The federal government, is nobody's forcing them to do that. They're doing that because they care about their consumers and they're concerned. And so um, I don't think we have a widespread problem. Again, this is not an organic issue. This is an issue, a food safety issue um, from contamination, um, unfortunately. So um, Becky, last question. Actually, I was going to make a statement um, that it's a very interesting in the legislature to find um, a such a bipartisan issue. The support, uh, for instance, for the funding, it was remarkable um, in that in that hearing how how supportive all in the entire legislative body supported uh, the farmers. So. I just, I think that, that was a very cool thing to have happen. Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, there's huge support for this issue across the board. The $60 million, it was a $100 million fund initially. Um, so unfortunately, the budget didn't um, end up with that full $100 million, but that was passed unanimously by both the House and the Senate here in Maine. So it just shows you, you know, that people really do want to support our farms and support the work that's happening. And um I'm gonna wrap up, but I'm gonna thank you all for coming tonight. I do encourage you to, um, if you're not already MAFCA members, to become MAFCA members, um, to support this work that we're doing. We would not have been able to pivot to be able to step up to meet this moment and work to support our farmers in the way that we have been able to over the last six months, had we not had such a strong foundation of support from our, our members and our donors and our supporters. Um, MAFCA is an incredible community and everybody comes together when there's a moment of need. Um, but we hope that you'll support us year round and um, so we can all continue the great work that we're doing. So thank you for being members. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> 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 you.